And I think the real strength of theater is its ability to talk directly to the audience. Hey, my name is Ben Charland. You're listening to What on Earth is Going On. Today's episode features the acclaimed Canadian playwright and screenwriter Nicholas Billen, who is known for plays such as Iceland, Greenland, and The Elephant Song. That last one was made into a feature film in 2014, for which Billen won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Now, if you're in Kingston and listening to this episode right after it is released, then let me step out of the usual podcasting convention of not timestamping this recording to keep it evergreen. Nick's play, it's excellent and gripping. It's called Butcher. It's on right now at the Kingston Grand Theatre until a matinee performance on Sunday, November 11th. If there are tickets left, I highly recommend that you check it out. Visit kingstongrand.ca for more. Now, before we get to it, I wanted to give you my usual plug. If you like this podcast, please get your friends and family to subscribe on the app of your choice, spread the word on social media, and give the show a rating on Facebook. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all under the handle Wogo Show. That's W-O-E-G-O Show. Finally, everything is on the website, including all previous episodes, and that's wogoshow.com. Go there, get in touch with me, send me your suggestions for guests or topics that you'd like to hear discussed. I really do look forward to hearing from you. My conversation with Nick goes a lot further than talking about his play Butcher. We discuss the future of theater as an art form, what its strengths and weaknesses are, and how it is a different beast from digital media, while at the same time asking what can or should theater do in this digital age. Is theater fundamentally a private or a public experience for the audience? Nick asks at one point, how do we create theater that makes people put their phones down? It's a sentiment that could be applied to any art form, though the other side of the coin is there too. How do we create theater that incorporates the phone, that incorporates technology, that rides the wave? We talk about people's beliefs and how they become entrenched and how power is often established on the threat of violence rather than violence itself and how that can be activated or shown on stage. There's also bits in there about Greek drama, the meaning of oppression, and even that odd convention of clapping our hands together at the end of a show. And of course, we do talk about Nick's play Butcher. It's a thrilling play with four actors set in a Toronto police station which deals with vengeance and the cycle of violence. One of the core questions that this play seems to ask, in Nick's words, is how do we punish the unpunishable? It's about justice, really, in the end. I was so glad to talk to the play's writer about this work and without giving any spoilers. But really, this conversation came down to one organizing principle— which Nick mentioned right off the top when I asked him, what on earth is going on? And that principle is empathy. What is empathy? Is it eroding? Why? And what can we do about it? What what is the meaning of empathy in our society? What are we doing when we're empathetic with somebody? Is it an action? Is it a behavior? Is it an attitude? And why is it so important not just to our lives as human beings, but perhaps even our democracy. Obviously, the discussion of empathy goes a lot deeper and further than this one conversation, but it is a good starting point. And I think when we talk about the art form of theater, it's probably as good of an art form as any when dealing with the creation and the use of empathy. Anyways, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. All right, Nick Billen, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'm a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk to you. Uh, we're sitting here in Kingston right now, and on right now at Theatre Kingston um, is bu- the play Butcher that you wrote. I think you wrote it back in 2014, is that right? That's right. So I, I want to talk about that play, and I want to talk a lot about a lot of other things that you've done in your career as a playwright and as a theatre person, um, the state of theatre today, what theatre still does. And I think, in, in my perspective, the play Butcher achieves what theatre does best. And I, we're going to talk about that a bit later, but the first question I want to give to you, which is always the same, Nick, what on earth is going on? It's a crazy world out there. Um, 
I think I think right now the thing that certainly is uh, strikes me the most is how uh, there seems to be a real erosion of empathy in the world, and uh, mm-hmm. and I think more than anything else that uh, that is the thing that worries me. Why? Why is that happening? I don't know. I think fear, mm-hmm. um, fear, fear of the other, uh, fear, fear. I think of both the direction of the world and and the complexity of the world um and how how it's just hard to understand everything that is going on right it's overwhelming and more overwhelming now than it's ever been before in a way i mean i'm not, i don't know right but i think in some ways uh yes only because uh technology begets technology and you know the the that the, the complexity keeps growing right uh, as we go along and i think it's going to keep going in that mm-hmm. direction it's it's a hard question this what on earth is going on because the second question almost always is well why and then the third question is well why now and is this really any different from 100 years ago or 1000 years ago i mean the human species is pretty much the same now as it was 70,000 years ago we haven't changed internally, biologically in that time, really all that much. Uh, our culture, all this, our civilization has changed radically. But are we truly living in a different time now than 10, 50, 100 years ago? Uh, I, w- I would say yes. I think just the existence of a cell phone is enough to say that our culture and our civilization is radically different. But, you know, a lot of scholars would accuse us of being what's called chronocentric, saying that our right. time is privileged, that our time is special, when really we're just in this continuum. Uh, but it, it's a hard debate. I mean, we talk about climate change. We talk about artificial intelligence. These are things that are unprecedented. Just the election of Donald Trump. I mean, it's Bill Maher on his show Real Time uh, just uh, the other evening, I think, said something like, um, this president is unprecedented and no historian can tell me that we've seen anything like it before. Andrew Jackson, I'm sorry, it's just not not the same thing. Um, but do you, I mean, where do you sit on this idea that, that our time is special or accelerated and that's why these things are happening? Uh, again, I'm not sure because I, uh, but I, I, I'll, it seems to me that one of the major, uh, one of the major things is that things are changing so rapidly. The rate of change, I think, is what is so different. So, uh, you know, if, if we plucked somebody from 1960, 1970 to today, mm-hmm. it would be like things, things, some things would be recognizable, but certainly everything to do with computers and all that would be totally foreign. Right. Uh, um, it just, it just feels like the, 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 the speed at which things are changing and evolving uh, is a speed that we are not used to. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think about even when I was growing up, I had a, I had a computer that was not connected to the internet. And I think to a teenager, the question is, what was the computer for? <laughs> what did you use that thing for? Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think that's, you know, that makes me feel old, but also, uh, I think that just shows how fast things have progressed. Right. Yeah, it's almost saying, like, telling me when I was a kid, yeah, I used to have a phone, but it only connected to one other phone. That's right. Right? Well, what was the point? Why don't you do... What? That doesn't make any sense. And then you just... Again, the rapid change that we've gone through. Um, You know, you're a a playwright, theater guy. What does theater... What role does this ancient art that perhaps what is possibly the most ancient art form that we have, theater or performance... What role does this have in this accelerated special time that we're in? Well, that's a big question. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think one. I think again. What I think is interesting about theater, and the theater that I think is is the most engaging is when it plays to its strengths, and I think the real strength of theater is its ability to talk directly to the audience. Mm. Um, and, and in some ways that's why, uh, a lot of my plays recently have been direct address because I feel like this is the thing that we can do in the theater that we cannot do in film. We cannot do in television. It's just not the same thing when an actor turns to the camera, mm-hmm. um, because we know that the actor is not talking to 
us directly. Right. Whereas in the theater, when you have an actor who's looking you in the eyes and telling you something, that's a person telling you something, whatever that, right. that thing is. Um, and so I think that to me is one of the, one of the, if I would say one of the levers of theater that I, that I love to use as much as, as much as possible. How, how is that different from film or television? I mean, when I'm watching a piece of theater, like I, I have a, I have an answer to this, but I'm not going to give it to you first. So when I'm watching a TV show or a film, I'm seeing people in the flesh per, being themselves sometime in some films, um, like your film, um, elephant song. Um, it's quite, it's quite, small in, in the sense that there we're only in a few different rooms throughout the film or in a few different settings and we're dealing with really three four characters um throughout that entire film so it's quite intimate and it does what theater does often which is bring us into an intimate setting but what's the there, there is a difference between theater and television and film but what does theater do that film and tv can't or what's what makes it unique i don't think I, i'm not sure that i know hmm. um I think I certainly, and again, the the experience is also very personal. I know that when I go to the theater, um, I'm I'm often looking for, um, I'm less looking for entertainment and more looking for some kind of engagement, mm. um, and uh, of course, never at the expense of entertainment i think if it's just you know uh, i've been to plays where i'm like actually this is an essay right. this is not a piece of theater um and there's a bit of a delicate balance there to to find between the, the those things um but uh, i i'm i'm not sure and i'm actually very curious to know what, what your answer to that is well my answer actually relates to your play butcher um, which is, so thank you for the segue. <laughs> so wh what I felt when I saw your play here in Kingston, um, was that it, as I said earlier, it does what theater does best, which is it suspended me for, well, for obviously for the 75 or 90 minutes that you're sitting there in that play to suspending your disbelief. It's asking you to go on that journey, but film and TV does that too. Film and TV mm -hmm. asks us to suspend yep. our disbelief, go on the journey, pretend that the world of the film is real. Uh, and enter into this totally other space. I think in theater, there's a sense, and this is almost Brechtian, right? The the the, the theater guy and, and then playwright in the 20th century, Bertolt Brecht from Germany, talked a lot about alienating the audience from the piece of theater they're watching so they don't get completely consumed by it and are always aware that they're watching theater. I would say theater is Brechtian by its very form. I would say that if I'm sitting in an audience, I'm always aware that I'm in a theater. I can... I can see the people that are around me in this production here in Kingston. I can see the audience across from me because it's done in a corridor, uh, in a corridor setting where I can see the audience members on the other side of the action. So I'm always very aware that I'm watching a play in a way that when I'm watching TV or a film, I'm not, I can kind of almost let it happen to me and I'm transported somewhere else. I think theater has to try pretty hard to transport me somewhere else. So mm -hmm. I think what theater does very well in spite of that, and what, what your play does really well, is not just suspend my disbelief, but to suspend my, my position in empathy uh, with the characters that I'm dealing and the actors that are on stage. It's not just the characters, but the actors, because I'm breathing with them. I'm watching them struggle with their role, with their performance, and I'm watching these characters engage in, you know, in Butcher, c it can be a mortal struggle. Yeah. Um, and my empathy goes back and forth amongst them. And this is what happened mm. specifically with the play Butcher. I'm watching these characters and my empathy, which is so interesting that you mentioned earlier, is darting back and forth between these characters. And I'm forced to ask myself the question. And I, I think this is something that film and theater or film and TV can do, but maybe it does in a different way and in not such an elongated way. I spent 20 minutes in your play sitting there asking myself what I would do if I was one of these characters and then mm -hmm. what I would do if I was another one. And I'm going back and forth between these four people and asking myself, God, if I was in this situation, could I do anything different? And if I could, what would it be? Would it be right? Would it be moral? Would I feel good about myself? Um, you know, your play deals a lot with vengeance and mercy and, and, and the cycle of violence. Um, and I don't... I don't know what I would do, but that's the whole point. And it asks me to, to think it through and feel it through. 
And I don't think that a lot of other art forms can do that as successfully or as viscerally. I think an essay can certainly pose those questions. But without empathy, the world may just become more and more confusing. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my long answer uh, to your question. That's but, a yeah. great answer. That's, <laughs> that's a super articulate answer. I really love it. And I think I, I'll, I'll yes and that by saying, I think one of the things that theater doesn't do, which is a big advantage, is there's no cutting in theater. Right. There's no editing. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly television and film, editing is such a powerful tool to, in a way, uh, emotionally manipulate the audience, and I, I, I don't mean that in a, in a, in a negative way at all, no. um, but in the theater, we, we can't do that. I, I can't control where your eye goes. Mm -hmm. Like, directors can try and do that through, through, um, through staging, but if you decide, I'm just going to look at this character the entire play, that is your prerogative to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in a sense, you, you go on that character's journey if you choose to do that. Hmm. Um, and I can look at other members of the audience too. I can I can just close my eyes and right. pay attention to myself or the sounds or the lighting grid or whatever. Yeah. And therefore, it's incumbent on maybe not so much the playwright but the director to think of the totality of the experience that they're creating. And you know, there's a lot of um, theater scholars and and practitioners like like Antonin Artaud who created theater of cruelty and tried to make you feel the total experience of the theater, whether it was worms being dropped on your head or a certain smell coming out of a doorway or something, to make sure that there was nothing that wasn't considered or affecting you throughout mm -hmm. the experience. That may be towards the essay side of theater as opposed to the entertaining side. But, um, but do, you think that, um, do you think that this produ production in particular at Theater Kingston achieved the... I mean, it not only achieved what your play is setting out to do, but achieved that totality as well. Uh, I think, huh. I think like every single production of Butcher that I've seen, I think it succeeds in some ways and falls short in others. Okay. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think there, there cannot be a perfect production of a play. Sure. I feel that that's, that's a, <laughs> that's a totally impossible thing. Um, to do, I think one of the things that I really appreciated about this the Kingston production, um, I thought the I thought this was, this is a combination of both the actors and the directors, but there was a very clear and good understanding of what power is, uh, and what I mean by that is the characters in the play who have power never need to fight to have that power; they just have it, and so they sit with that power. Hmm. And, and kind of wield it without ever needing to raise their voice or uh, res resort to violence hmm. to impose it. it. They just have it. Um, right. and, and I think that is something that we're... I think that is, a, that is an understanding of power that we don't see often enough. Power is often, you, it, power is often uh, illustrated through violence. Right. Um, but I think that the real power is a power where, where it's it's above violence. It doesn't even t need to resort to that. It'll get other people to do it for for them, but they don't have to resort. So do you mean do you mean that in the play um, power is static? That that the power dynamics may be uncovered, but but that the power is the same from beginning to end? Oh God, no. Okay. No, no, it's not static, but it's not. It doesn't. True power doesn't need to remind people that it's the true power. Mm. Uh, it just, it just is, and then just pulls the strings that it needs to pull. Interesting. Um, and I think w what happens in Butcher is that, um, is that, that, that power shifts, especially near the end, that power shifts in a way that is unexpected for the person who, uh, who holds that power. Well, and it's therefore unexpected for us in the audience. The, hopefully, yes. Right, and that, and that the, the power... I mean, it reminded me of a Harold Pinter play, or, or any Harold Pinter play, and the dynamic of power that happens in there, which is incumbent on the threat of violence, and sometimes even the use of violence. Yeah, Pinter's yeah. a perfect example of this. The, the thing that is so... Um, uh, that, that provokes anxiety when watching a Pinter play, it's not watching violence it's the constant threat of violence that is underlying uh everything right. and the words that people say and and often um i'm trying to remember the the 
<laughs> the Pinter play that I'm thinking of, but there there is a play where it might be the homecoming where there's one character who spends most of the play sitting in a chair. It's the homecoming. Yeah. 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 And it's the person with all the power. Yeah. It doesn't move. Doesn't need to. Um, and uh, for that, Pinter was really a master of 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 examining those dynamics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I uh, we could spend a whole episode, I think, talking about. <laughs> we Harold sure Pinter. could. I certainly could. I, I uh, I'm a big fan of the guy's work. I did. Uh, I directed a few years ago, The Dumb Waiter, oh, yeah. uh, or co-directed it uh, in Calgary, which was a really interesting process. And it's an earlier Pinter play. Um, when he was still trying to figure out how, I mean, he un- obviously understood these power dynamics, but he was still experimenting with how that could be revealed and and actioned on yeah. stage. Yeah. Um, when like, how many? Uh, where does Butcher fall in in your in your career? I mean, it's not the beginning of your career, certainly not the end. But but was it a was it something that you were still learning to do, or was it? Did you feel like you were quite confident with the art form when you wrote it? Uh, oh God, no. I I don't think. I think I'm still learning with every play. Um, but I think the thing that I try to do is I try to do something different with every play. Uh, I, I, I really try very hard not to repeat myself uh, from play to play. And with Butcher, what I wanted to do there was I was, uh, I was thinking, I love thrillers. I love watching thrillers. I grew up on Hitchcock. I, mean, I, I have great memories of my mother and I sitting on a couch watching a Hitchcock, just loving the whole experience. Um, and it's, I find that it's, the thriller is not a genre that we see on stage very often. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I, I kind of like set out that challenge for myself. I was like, can we do a thriller on stage? Hmm. Um, and one of the things that I knew right from the get go is that with the thriller, um, I didn't want to do a lot of stage combat. I don't like stage combat. Yeah. Uh, I find that it always looks kind of wanky. Yeah. Uh, it's so not what theater does best. It, absolutely not. Yeah. And again, it's always that idea of like play to your strengths. Um, the only time I've seen any kind of stage combat work is when dancers do it uh, because they really have full control of their bodies. Um, but, uh, so I, I knew that it wasn't going to be a play where there's going, there wasn't going to be a lot of fighting. There wasn't going to be action in that sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so that, that was one of the, one of the rules that I gave myself when starting out with Butcher. Um, and, um, and I went back to my, to kind of my roots, which is Greek drama, which I love and I've adapted several times and in a way, and, and. I don't think anybody watching Butcher would would uh, would make this connection, but Butcher is a retelling of the Oresteia. Um It's just very very far removed from it, but that was that was the original kind of template for it. Um, and in the Oresteia, what we have is the first example that we know of of a trial by jury, um, which is the real first step towards uh, a justice that moves away from an eye for an eye. Mm-hmm. Um. We, the play deals a lot with vengeance, this idea of, oh, and justice. You know, yeah. there's, there are characters in the play who believe that what they're doing, in contradiction to what the others believe they're doing, is for the purpose of justice. And it's the, these differing ideas of what justice is. And of course, if I believe justice is A, and you believe justice is B, well, I'm not just going to say, you know what, you're right, because it's not a rational argument. These are very tribal, deep-seated, deep-rooted ideas. I don't know if you have heard or read the, the scholar uh, Jonathan Haidt, um, who wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, um, and he he's a moral psychologist. Yes. Yeah. I think I've read a, one of his books, but not that one. Um, he wrote another book recently. I think it's called The Coddling of the American Mind. Okay. Um, but but his, I mean, the, the main takeaway for me from his work has been that when you have an, an opinion about something, when you believe something morally, so for example, you believe that incest is wrong, or you believe that murder is wrong, or you believe that abortion should be restricted, or you believe it should be unrestricted. These are moral beliefs. They're not, you know, I believe that the tax rate should be 2% higher. Right. Right. It's not it's not a political or or administrative issue. It's a moral issue. These moral things that you believe are really um, dependent on 
your your tribe, your people, your group, your situation, your upbringing. Um, and if you change your mind on something, it's almost never because of a rational argument. That's right. It's always because someone who you've been t- been talking to or relating to, you decide you're going to move over to their side, really. The, this ties in. I, there, there's a name for this, I, which I don't remember, but it's this idea that um, if you have a, a belief or a position and you're presented with facts with which counter that yeah. position, you actually believe more strongly right. in your initial position. Totally. That's, I mean... From a rational point of view, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. But then from an emotional point of view, I go, I kind of get that. From an empathy point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Because the person who's telling you all these facts isn't asking you to empathize. They're actually hitting you. I mean, that, that's what the mind, if the mind feels under, sta- under siege or the, the, the person feels like they're under siege. So what do you do? Well, you're going you're gonna to go into a ball. You're going to strengthen. You're going to put your hand into a fist yeah. as opposed to shake the other person's you're gonna, hand. You're going to dig that trench a little deeper. Right. Yeah. And, and so anyways, this is what this scholar, Jonathan Haidt, often talks about as a, as a moral psychologist is, you know, why do we believe the things we believe and why do we believe them so strongly? And justice and vengeance is one of these things, which is why in watching your play, I'm sitting there thinking these people aren't going to suddenly realize, yeah, what I'm doing is wrong and I give up and uh, maybe we can just shake hands and forget it ever happened. That's not going to happen. Yeah. There, I'm not going to give anything away, but there is a moment in the play where a character tries to stop the cycle of violence and vengeance. Um, and it was a very powerful, interesting moment that this production really tried, I think, to highlight. Yep. Um, but of course, the anyways, I won't give I, anything away. But, and, yeah. but And I think to, the, to your point, that character tries to do so through rational... Yes. Um, means. And uh, it, it, uh, I, uh, it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Is this play, in a, uh, in a way, a, a struggle between the rational and the emotional, or the passionate? I, I think that's certainly in there. Okay. Um, I think one of the key things about Butcher, um, and, and, and this I'll, I'll say right away, is something that I, um, that I get from Carol Churchill, mm. is uh, I'm not trying to answer the question here. Because I, I'm certainly not qualified to answer it, and I'm not sure that there is an answer to mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I am interested in asking the question, and then taking that question and exploring it from every side that I can. Right. Um, and and really going, uh, I understand both sides. I you know as as I I really liked when you said uh, you know you had shifting allegiances in a way during the play because uh you know hopefully that that is the experience of most people seeing that play i I, there Mm -hmm. is no i don't think there's really a hero in butcher right uh you know there there are people who are all right and all wrong Hmm. um and and so it's very hard to to kind of pick someone and go i'm on team right you know but that's the strength of it i think i think that's the power of the play is that it's asking you or asking the audience not to take sides but to take positions for a moment and then suspend it and move to another position knowing what you knew about that one and saying well if i'm in this other character's shoes god what would i do yeah what would i be thinking right now um and i, I think ahead. it's a very uncomfortable position for people because it's not a position that we used to be in right but maybe uncomfortable, but I would say critical. Um, I would say so too. Uh, you know, I think critical for our society, critical for our democracy. If we're going to make moral decisions, um, whether it's, you know, again, changing the tax rate by 2% or something that is between pro-life and pro-choice, uh, or if it's t- talking about the cycle of violence in our justice system, these are really deep questions and problems. And the only way... I think at least the argument for theater would say the only way to really be able to humanely deal with these issues is through empathy. And if we're living in a society, as you say, where we are seeing an erosion of empathy, is I mean, I don't maybe we're we're vaunting it a bit too high to say that theater is the answer to give us more empathy. But but is there a solution out there to increase empathy or to ask us to put each other in each other's shoes? I, I don't know. I. I... You know, I I agree. I don't think the answer is like theater's theater's not the answer. I think it's it's a theater may be part of the answer, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but certainly you know certainly a small part of it. Um, I, I I don't know. I honestly don't know. And that's um, and I think 
in a way, if, if some of the anxiety I have of, about the future is that I don't know how we can have a dialogue. Uh, it really feels like the more it goes, the more positions become entrenched mm. and, and, and we stop listening to what everybody else is saying. It just mm -hmm. becomes this, this weird echo chamber mm -hmm. that we're all in. Yeah. It's, it's one of the reasons I'm doing this show actually is to, to have dialogue, to have a conversation. Cause what I know in my experience is, is that if I'm sitting in person across from somebody else, we're almost never going to hate each other. It just doesn't That's happen right. that way. Human beings yep. don't work that way. If you're sitting and having a dialogue, you come to an accord. You come to not an agreement. You might we you and I might disagree on everything we talk about, but we have an understanding that we're sharing this time and this space. It's yep. almost like breaking bread together in an old society, right? Um, and I know that if we can at least establish that, then we might find things that we have agreement on or or we just understand how to better construct our disagreement. Um, you're probably familiar with Augusta Boal, the, mm -hmm. the, the South American, yep. Latin American um, theater person from the 20th century. He famously said that oppression is a relationship in which there is no dialogue, only monologue. Yeah. And, and I think theater, again, can encapsulate that so perfectly. That is a, that is a saying for our time, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah. Too many people don't uh, don't know about Augusta Boal. I think <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the solution. That's the answer. Augusta Boal, just bring yeah. him back out and uh, have some the forum theater and theater of the oppressed, and we'll solve all the world's problems. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to to Greek theater, mm -hmm. um, and I did. I, I didn't think about the Oresteia in watching your show, but I did think about Greek theater because there's something classically tragic about it. You know, again, if we're talking about that suspension, um, and it's just. Uh, you know, I don't know if you... I'm going to put you on the spot with a question, which is, do you think that theater as an art form, I mean, in in the modern version of it, is private or public in terms of the audience's experience? Oh, boy. Uh, I would say... Uh, hmm. I would say public. Uh, okay. I would have... I, I, you right. know, I have to think about it. Yeah. But ultimately, I would say it's public. So what what does that mean, and why is it public? It's public because uh, well, because it's a shared experience. Uh, you know, there you don't you're not alone when you're seeing right. a, a piece of theater, right? Um, and and so you are sharing that experience with other people, um, and. Uh, and and ultimately, and it's funny because you you referred to that earlier. Is you can you can choose to watch the audience rather than the mm -hmm. rather than the action. So it, it is it is public. Your your reaction is public. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, and I I don't mean to play devil's advocate. I just I, this Please is do. A, this is a debate I'm having with myself about is theater public or private. Clearly, going on watching binging Netflix is a private experience. Even if I'm sitting next to somebody, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to make it public it's pretty hard to make it a communal shared experience the only way to do that is to talk over what we're watching or press pause yeah and so and 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 you know halt the experience yeah. so that we can actually put it to the side and have our shared experience theater you can't i mean <laughs> even if someone raised their hand and said can you please pause the play so we can talk about this which is a guy augusta Boal, actually right. yes anyways if, if someone actually did that well that's part of the experience the experience continues we are still in this shared space but there is, an, there is an idea which is maybe more modern, whereas g the Greek theater was clearly a public experience. It was yeah. actually not so much an art form as an extension of government and an extension of the, of the higher society, an extension of, of keeping things together, right? And it was, mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not articulating this very well, but it wasn't just something to the side that we do for fun. It was very much a part of Athenian democracy to have mm -hmm. theater. Um, but in, in experiences today, someone can go to a play, watch the play, not meet anybody, not talk to anybody, and go away with their own personal experience. And of course, it's a lot of writers and directors would love the idea that different audience members have different takeaways, go away with a completely different experience and memory of what happened. That, that to me, is a very private journey that you go on. The, 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 the existence of other people in the space is just an added, it's almost like watching Netflix, but with a bunch of people in the room. You know, and th there yeah. are some films that are that are shared experiences, whether it's um, the, the, the film The Room, uh, where people throw spoons at the at the th I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, I don't think I have. 
It's it's like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay. Except it's a it's a it's a, oh, oh the, uh, yes yes um, yes okay yes it's the disaster yeah. artist yes is, yeah right. anyways yeah so that makes cinema into a communal experience yeah. but so there's this anyways it's a gray well, area well the one thing yeah. I would say about theater is that the one place where maybe uh, you can see that is at the end when people clap do people clap do they stand do they not clap mm. there is there is that moment at the end because you don't do that watching Netflix right. You know, no. it can be the greatest show in the world, <laughs> you know, unless it's a joke, nobody's going to be giving it a standing ovation in their living room. Right. Uh, but, but with theater, you do, you can have that. And, you know, I always think it's very interesting watching shows where you have 90% of the people on their feet, but then you've got 10, 10% who don't, and maybe 10% uh, of that 10% who aren't even clapping. And you go, that's really interesting because clearly these people have had a different experience than the others of yeah. this, of this show. Um, the, the idea of clapping has always been interesting to me. The idea that we clap at the end of a show. I've seen, I've yeah. seen movies where people clap at the end of it yes, and it almost right. feels awkward. Yeah, like, are, it we, does. are we clapping? Nobody is hearing this. Yeah. The actors aren't in the, in the audience. This isn't like a premiere or something. Um, uh, and, I remember when I was in school, theater school, many years ago, um, someone had a note on their door and it said, when you watch a show, don't clap. It's like, what is it with this clapping at the end? That's taking the energy that you feel, all the things that you've just experienced in your body, all this empathy, and just, you know, expending it out into your hands, right? I mean, I, I, I'm skeptical of it too, yeah. but, but it is questioning this, this thing which may not always be of service to the experience that we're going through. That sometimes the, the feeling that we're left with in the end, I'd rather just sit with that for a second before I start clapping. I just need to feel it. Yep. Um, what, do you, what do you think of that? I mean, I'll t uh, w when we did Butcher in Calgary, the, the premiere, mm -hmm. uh, I remember opening night at the end, the lights went down. Nobody clapped. There was this real moment of just having to sit with, <laughs> with, yeah. with the experience that they just went through. Um, and I think the thing, uh, that we did in Calgary, which I think was smart was that we, the, the blackout was much longer than it would normally be. Mm. Uh, so it gave, it gave people a chance to just, you know, give them a right. few seconds a to like do that. And then when the lights come up, then, you know, people would clap. Um, but I, I you know, I also wonder there's, so, there, there can also be something cathartic about just clapping and like, I think just punctuating the end of a show knowing like mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're done and now we can purging it. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, um, that, that, uh, that's obviously how I feel when I, when I go to see a show, it's like, okay, it's done. Good. I can just put it behind me for a second and maybe I'll think about it later when I sit at a table with a few other people and talk about what I just saw. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's the feeling that there's this obligation to no, it's time to clap everybody. Yep. Um, and you know, sometimes also the obligation to stand up. If the people in front of you and beside you stand up, well, yep. you better stand up too because you're in a public space. We've all been there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, but I, but it's so interesting because I think that's that's really good training on the idea of um, of of resistance, of going. Mm. You know, we're, we're I, I think. I'll give you uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, when Butcher was done in Montreal, I went there for a talkback, and uh, in the talkback, this this uh, older woman raised her hand and she said, "I really did not like this play. I was very upset by this play, and I was really I don't understand why I, why I was subjected to this play." And the first thing I said to her is, "I said uh, thank you, because what you just did took a lot of courage." And it's true. She was. She stood up in a room full of people, who were more on the positive side, and she voiced her opinion, uh, mm. which was contrarian. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought that is amazing. That is amazing that she's able to do that. And really, I I was like hats off to her right. for being able to do that. That that's a good segue into. I mean, the play deals with this question of genocide. This word genocide. Um, obviously, there's no genocide happening on stage or maybe there are maybe maybe it is in a in an indirect way or a continuation of what genocide is but genocide is a very difficult subject matter and there was a review of of this play butcher when it first came out in calgary in 2014 by the globe and mail that actually asked the question is it wrong to make a play about genocide so entertaining mm. 
mm-hmm. and, and, and so thrilling? Is that wrong? I mean, you could ask that same question of so many different films, so many different pieces of art. I mean, was, was Picasso wrong to paint Guernica? A piece that is really quite thrilling to the eye, mm-hmm. but is about mass slaughter uh, prior to the Second World War. But I, I, I'm not trying to ask that question. I'm not trying to ask you that. I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's wrong to make genocide thrilling and entertaining and interesting because that's how we engage with these big questions. But my question is, how, I mean, how do we engage with, with such a, a dark issue? And how do, we, how do we keep make? I mean, this is maybe a bit of a pun given the play. How do we not let people off the hook of, of thinking about these things by making it just laughable or mm-hmm. something we can forget? How do we make it undeniable, but at the same time still respectful? Well, um, I don't know that I, ha- that I have an answer to that, but I will say certainly with Butcher, I think one of the, the, the key things for me is um, at no point did I want the idea of, of genocide, the idea of pain, the idea of torture um, to ever be um, to ever be for, for, for lack of a better word, to ever be pornographic. It's never about um, making it an object of spectacle, mm. um, which is why all the violence, and this is clearly indicated in the script, all the actual violence that takes place on stage has to be hidden or it has to be stylized right. in some way. Right. Um, because it's not about that. It's not about, you know, showing violence on stage. I think with um, part of the reason, and I think this is this is where kind of the headline from the from the Globe and Mail uh, yeah. came from, is that I, I I don't think we need to watch a play that tells us that genocide is horrible. Mm. I think we we know that. Yeah. Like I don't I don't think we need to sit through ninety minutes to to get through that. If, uh, if it was, that would be that. almost propaganda. It would almost be saying, this is what you should believe about the following things. Please sit and watch That's it. That's right. You're doing it something. Be, it becomes an essay. Right. Again. Yeah. Um, and really, what I, what I was trying to do with Butcher is that the, the, the thriller aspect and the, the entertaining aspect, it's a head fake. It's, I'm, I wasn't trying to... to um, it was a head fake to talk about the things that I wanted to talk about, which was... How, how do we punish the unpunishable? Right. Um, and so, uh, in a way, I can I can shut off the um, I can shut off the brain with the thriller aspect and get to the heart with the with the actual question that the play is asking. Right. 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 Is that is that related to why you used this Lavinia? This um, this uh, fictitious country in the Balkans, with with also a language that was actually created by two scholars in Toronto. Is that part of why you you did that? That is exactly why I did it because I knew that if I used a real conflict, whatever conflict it was going to yeah. be, if I used a real conflict, the question that would come out of it is how historically accurate mm-hmm. was he? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I don't think he depicted this side uh, fairly. fairly. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to have that conversation because that, that is not the conversation I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. So the way to do that is to just remove that entirely from the equation mm-hmm. and create, it's, it's a country that doesn't exist. It, they're speaking a language that nobody outside the world of the play understands. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then, hopefully, the conversation will be about the things that I I'm hoping that the conversation will be about. So here's just a question that's occurring to me now. I mean, Lavinia in the plays, it seems to be a Eastern European country, Eastern European language, uh, ethnically Eastern European. If someone came to you and said, I want to do this play, but I would like to set it in a fictitious Eastern African country, somewhere around the area of Rwanda. Uh, but but not Rwanda, right? Uh, and I want to create a language that's similar to that, um, and with obviously people who are ethnically Eastern African. Would you would you go along with that, or would you? I would certainly be open to it. Um, and, and in fact, you know, uh, originally this play was about Rwanda. Okay. Um, and in fact, some of the aspects, uh, some of the things that they talk about in the play are taken from the Rwandan genocide, not from the Balkan Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I can't really say what they no, are no. without giving too much away, but, yeah. uh, 
but the, you know, there there are definite. There's a definite uh, s- direct line between Butcher and Rwanda, 1994. Right. Um, and uh, you yeah. know, I, I, so again, that's why I'm like, it's not. S- sometimes people think this is a play about the Balkan Wars, but it, it's really not. Not. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it just so happens that the 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 two women who created the language, who are both professors at um, at U of T in the Slavic Languages Department. Uh, you know, th- because of their specialty, they they used a variety of Slavic languages mm. to come up with Lavinian. Mm-hmm. Um, so that people who do speak um, any of the Slavic languages, to them, it it's familiar, but the content is is nonsense. They'll maybe right. catch a word here and there, right? But and nobody nobody understands what's being said. I'm going to ask you another question, which is also occurring to me now, and it's a tough one because it's. Um, it goes to the heart of what an artist does and what an artist is allowed to do, at least what is acceptable in our society today, cultural appropriation. Um, I've spoken to people who clearly say, look, you can write about anything you want and say anything you want, and regardless of your background and experience, and and it should be taken for what it is. Um, And if you go to Rwanda and spend seven years doing research about the Rwandan genocide and write a book about it, and you're white Western... That's fine. There are other people who say you essentially have no right to do such a thing. The people who should write about, say, people in Rwanda should be Rwandans. The people who should write about people in the Balkans should be people from the Balkans. Because anybody else is bringing, especially from the West, is bringing their imperial Western perspective to the issue. And then, you know, we're dealing with subjectivity and um, qualitative over quantitative. And we're, we're, ta- we're getting into this conversation about what is acceptable and not acceptable. But cultural appropriation seems to me in the last few years has become a real no no. When I, just 10 years ago, again, when I was in theater school, I mean, we didn't talk. You go explore. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter what color of your, your skin is or, or your eyes or your hair color or your background or your language. Go and explore. And if you want to write something about something, go for it. Um, obviously, be mindful of where you're coming from and not to do certain things, but go for it. It seems today that that, in many circles, is just completely taboo. What do you think about this? I, I mean, I know it's a tough question because it's it's something that might even get people in trouble by certain things they say. But, um, Well, I think, uh, I think so far uh, that is not something I've had to deal with mm-hmm. in any of my plays. Uh, uh, again, I, 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 my answer to that is I, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm always shy away from, uh, from, um, from polar positions one way or the other. Uh, and I think, I think there is, I think there's a balance to be found somewhere between the, those, those two extremes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, th- I, I, I think there is. There, without a doubt, there is a uh, a genuine argument uh, in the camp of cultural appropriation that you can't you can't just take someone's story and tell it and yeah. make it. I I think that is uh, I think that is absolutely right. It's I, almost like theft to do so. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think often it can lead to to uh, to, to stereotyping and to you know and and. You know, yeah. we th- that's not interesting. That's a, that's a, in a way that's kind of lazy. Yeah. Um. And uh. And and you know nobody should be writing lazy art. Um. So uh, yeah, but I, I you know again, but I also think like sometimes that can be taken too far. Mm-hmm. Uh. And and I don't think that's. Um. Yeah. Again, it's it's finding that balance, mm-hmm. um, and I certainly think there's there's there. I think for me, one of the things I've heard was um, uh, uh, you can't tell our story uh, without us, uh, without involving somebody in the process. Right. And I think that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think I think uh, I'm thinking of Lepage and uh, with right. uh, Canada. You know, and I, 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 I admit I was, I was like, yeah, how is there, how are there no first nation people involved in that project? Mm-hmm. That, that's crazy. That mm-hmm. actually really feels crazy. Right. Um, and, uh, and I think it was a mistake. 
Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, I mean, the, the reason, I mean, I, I agree that it's also quite boring and uninteresting if you simply go and write, if you just take a, take a story and make it your own. I mean, it's not, it's not asking a new question. If you're going to some other culture or place or, or world and appropriating something for your own uses, it's not interesting. But if you go somewhere to try to tell someone else a story, in doing so, you might learn something about that other, per- other person's story and they of yours. Mm-hmm. And then you create what we're doing now, which is dialogue. You create a conversation that might not have been there before. And I think that you know, when it's not cultural appropriation, when it's not theft... Then it, then it might actually be a good thing. I mean, when we talk about the arts, theft is everywhere. I mean, theft is almost encouraged, right? Yeah. I mean, we talked about Pinter. I mean, there's no way that your readings of plays or, or when you watch plays by Pinter or Beckett or, or you know, the, the many plays that you've seen in your career have not informed you and informed you in such a way that you say to yourself, I'm going to use that idea. That's cool. Or I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to explore that. I mean, to to an outsider, it might look like theft, but really that's what art is. It's this constant evolution, this constant conversation mm-hmm. with the people who have come before or who are happening right now. And I think that when we recognize that it's not theft, it's actually the, quite the opposite. It's, it's respect that certain things are acceptable. So long as it's not, so long as it involves the other side, so long as it's dialogue and not monologue, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, just one one last question to go back to um, to empathy. Um, you know, I know that we we don't have the answers here to the to the ills of the world and to the failings of our society and so forth. Um, but we we do know that the, the, at least the intent of a play like Butcher or in theater in general is to create a sense of empathy. Do you think that? I mean, just as someone who works in the theater, who watches and consumes a lot of performance. Do you think that theater is getting better at this? Do you think it's, it's keeping up with, say, someone bringing in a mobile phone? I mean, th- the reason for this question mm. is is that, um, you know, theater has always been in competition with radio, then with television, and then with cinema, and now with these cell phones. And um, some people working in the theater are trying to allow a person to bring in their phone and interact with mm-hmm. what they're watching and make it part of the experience. But do you think that this core principle of theater, which is to, again, suspend the disbelief, to, to empathize with a, a living person who is not just sitting next to you, but who's also standing on stage and breathing mm-hmm. and performing a role. Do you think it's keeping up? Do you think it's succeeding at this, at, at being the art form that it is? Or do you think it's truly threatened by the technological forces that are at play? Well, I'm, I'm certainly not worried about theater as a, uh, a, a theater survival. Uh, in that sense, I think there will always be theater. I think, um, uh, I, I think honestly, I think the only thing that could kill theater is if it becomes unaffordable. Huh. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think a lot of theater is, is much too expensive uh, for for people to go to. And and frankly, I understand where that cost comes from. I'm not saying that it's yeah, you know, it's expensive to do theater. I totally get that. Um, but I see it more as, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I wish we had a more European model where the government funds theater in such a way that it is affordable for students or anyone. Mm. Um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, things like cell phones and theater, all that, um, you know, I think I think we need to just. You know the world is changing, and we kind of have to go with that. But I think that, I think the more interesting challenge is, uh, can we create theater that makes people put their phones down? Um, mm-hmm. Can we find a way to engage in such a way that it can pull, it can pull that away um, from mm-hmm. that kind of constant boredom that I think a lot of us are just kind of uh, struggling with. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, that like that's a play I want to go see. Yeah, you know, that would be the best review ever. I, you know, it got my teenager to put his his or her phone away. <laughs> I'm like, I'm seeing that play. <laughs> I don't care how much it costs. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's almost like uh, you know, you go to a concert now, and it's just a sea of of cell phones. 
um, yep. watching the act, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, most concerts just say, whatever, that's what it is. We're not going to fight against that. And there are very, you know, there are some moments in a concert which convinces people to put their phone down, but there's always going to be someone who wants to record that bit that's really quiet and beautiful or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting question to me because to what extent is this a competition or to what extent or, or a contradiction between these different forces and to what extent mm-hmm. should it be just just a synthesis? You know, I, I, I am someone who wants to go see a piece of theater and put my phone away. Absolutely. Um, yeah. but, but maybe I'm holding on to something too strongly and maybe we need to find a way to go with the flow. Um, I mean, like I'm with you. I think that I want to have something that convinces the people around me to want to put their phones away. But, you know, but not all theater is going to be able to do that. Some theater is going to ask you to participate yeah. and, and be more active in it, maybe more political fashion. So tweet out when you hear something that bothers you or something. Right. I don't know. I mean, it's to me, it's an interesting question and something that theater is going to have to organically figure out as it as it evolves. Yep. And And different people will find different solutions to that. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah. Uh, Nick, is there anything that we've, uh, we've missed in talking about anything that, uh, about the play, for example, I mean, <laughs> should, should I put out a plug for this show or <laughs> anything else I've missed? No, I think, uh, I think we, we covered, uh, we covered quite a few things today. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking hey, the time. Thank you so much. All right, I've got to give you a plug one more time for that show and step out of the usual evergreen podcast form and give you a timestamp. So Butcher is running at the Kingston Grand Theatre in Kingston until November the 11th at 2.30 matinee, and you can get tickets at kingstongrand.ca. Please check it out if you have the time. If you hear this episode in time, I'd highly recommend it, as you can tell from my conversation with Nick. And Nick also has a website, nicholasbillen.com but that's without an h so n i c o l a s b i l l o n.com please check it out he's got quite an interesting catalog of work and you're probably going to be able to see a play of his or even a film the elephant song uh, which was released in 2014 again i'd highly recommend learning about him checking out his work he does some pretty interesting stuff uh, for a canadian playwright now your quote of the week is from, I couldn't help myself, Augusto Boal, as I talked about a little bit in the conversation, but it's not the monologue dialogue one, which is one of my favorites. It is something a little bit similar, uh, and I think it does have to do with empathy. Here goes. We are all actors. Being a citizen is not living in society. It is changing it. Remember that you can get all previous episodes. This is not the quote by Bo Al anymore, by the way. You can get all previous episodes at wogoshow.com. That's W-O-E-G-O show.com. All previous episodes as well as links to social media and a way to get in touch with me if you have any suggestions for future episodes, whether that's a topic or a guest you'd like to see. Anyways, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. See you next week.